Okay. Ready? Call me in order. Please rise for the flag salute. To the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, will the city recorder please call roll? Councillor Bolin. Here. Councillor Dykstra. Here. Councillor Grizzle. Here. Councillor Nassar. Here. Councillor Reese Camp. Here. And Councillor Steinhebel. Here. All right. The first thing on the agenda is the swearing in an oath of office for our newest councillor, Gamal Nassar. And the city recorder will be handling that virtually. Please, please state your name and say I, then repeat after me. I, I, Gamal Nassar, do solemnly swear and affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm that I will support the United States Constitution. That I will support the United States Constitution. Oregon Constitution. Oregon Constitution. And of the Charter and Laws of the City of Lebanon. And the Charter and Laws of the City of Lebanon. And that I will faithfully perform. And that I will faithfully perform. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. For which I have been appointed. For which I have been appointed. Congratulations. Congratulations. Now, if you could sign the oath in front of you. Okay. So it's too late to vote no on him. Way too late. That... Way too late. <laughs> okay. Just clarifying. Yes, ma'am. I would expect nothing less. <laughs> Uh, first up is the consent calendar. The following consent calendar items are considered routine, will be enacted by one motion. There will not be a separate discussion of these items unless the counselor so requests. In this case, the items will be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately. Tonight, we have the uh, tonight's agenda for the April 14th meeting. We have the 2021 Surface Transportation Fund Exchange Agreement, uh, the River Road Reconstruction Project, the Planning Commission note uh, minutes from December 16th of 2020. Uh, contract to award financial audit services and the council minutes from March 10th, 2021. I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we have some proclamations. First up is the City of Lebanon Arbor Month. Whereas the last year has brought many changes and challenges, we have found much comfort in our local parks, trails, and other green space planted with many trees. And whereas we are proud to announce an update from the celebration of Arbor Day to Arbor Month. And whereas in 1872, J. Sterling Morton proposed that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees. And whereas this holiday was called Arbor Day and first observed with the planting of more than a million trees in Nebraska. And whereas Arbor Month is now observed throughout the nation and around the world. And whereas trees can reduce the erosion of our precious topsoil by wind and water, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce life-giving oxygen, and provide habitat for wildlife. And whereas trees are a renewable resource, giving us paper, wood for our homes, fuel for our fires, and countless other products. And whereas trees in our city increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of business areas, and beautify our community. And whereas trees, wherever they are planted, are a source of joy and spiritual renewal, now, therefore, I, Council President Jason Boland, do hereby proclaim April Arbor Month in the city of Lebanon. I urge all citizens to celebrate Arbor Month, support efforts to protect our trees and woodlands and plant trees to promote the well-being of this and future generations. May 2021 is also being proclaimed Mental Health Awareness Month. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas promotion and prevention are effective ways to reduce the burden of mental health conditions, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives, and whereas each of us has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts, now therefore, I, Council President Jason Bolin, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Lebanon, and call about, upon the community to commit to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, the steps we can take to prevent, protect our mental health, and the need for appropriate and accessible services for those in need. Now a special one for Rebecca, this is May 2021 Older Americans Month. 
Whereas older Americans enrich and strengthen our community, and whereas Lebanon is committed to engaging and supporting older adults, their families, and caregivers, and whereas the city acknowledges the importance of taking part in activities that promote physical, mental, and emotional well being, no matter your age, and whereas we can enrich the lives of individuals of every age by promoting home and community based services that support independent living, involving older adults in community planning, events, and other activities, and providing opportunities for older adults to work, volunteer, learn, lead, and mentor. Now, therefore, I, Council President Jason Boland, do hereby proclaim May 2021 as Older Americans Month. I urge our citizens to take time to acknowledge our older adults and the people who serve them as vital parts of our community. And finally, we have the proclamation of National Police Week and Peace Officers Memorial Day. Whereas members of the Lebanon Police Department play an essential role in safeguarding the lives and property of the citizens of Lebanon, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems, duties, and responsibilities of their police department, and that members of our police department recognize their duty to serve people by safeguarding life and property, and whereas nearly 60,000 assaults against law enforcement officers are reported each year, resulting in approximately 16,000 injuries. Now, therefore, I, Council President Jason Bullen, declare May 9th through 15th, 2021, as Police Week in Lebanon, and publicly salute the service of law enforcement officers in our community and in communities across the nation. I further call upon all citizens of Lebanon to observe Saturday, May 15th, 2021, as National Peace Officers Memorial Day in honor of all officers who have been killed or disabled in the line of duty. And we are fortunate to have a fantastic police department here in our city, and we're happy to celebrate that day. Woo! Uh, it's time for public comments. The city recorder has... Have you received any additional public comments not included in the council packet? No, no other comments were received. Okay, all councilors have received uh, via email the comments uh, that were submitted by the public regarding different items on this agenda and they have all been reviewed. And uh, there is one also, or one other comment from the Lebanon Downtown Association that I will read. Uh, Lebanon Downtown Association is as busy as ever with summer event planning. LDA committees are working to bring quality entertainment and education into downtown. These are some of the updates on uh, a few of their community projects. The promotion committee's first Friday event in April brought close to 100 people into downtown for a poker run. Next month, first Friday, we'll highlight Cinco de Mayo to educate families on why the day is celebrated through a scavenger hunt in downtown. For details, visit the first Friday's Downtown Lebanon Facebook page. The promotion committee member, uh, Alan, Alan Nixon with Perspective Productions is creating 18 second video shorts to highlight the restaurants, stores and professional services downtown. These videos will be posted on the LDA website as well as on the Lebanon Downtown Association YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe and follow what is happening downtown. The concert steering committee is gearing up for a summer full of music. Last year due to funding issues, Concerts in the Park was canceled for 2020. This year, Concerts in the Park and Summer Bands and Brews are uh, considered a go starting in July and ending in August. Watch the LDA website and Facebook pages for more concert updates. To promote the summer concert series, concert steering committee member Bill Anton with Mid Valley Productions is holding monthly live streams of local. The next live stream is 6 p.m. Saturday, April 24th from Barsidius Brewing downtown. The design committee submitted a competitive grant application to Travel Oregon for funding to add new black stainless steel trash cans throughout downtown, convert the water fountain at the corner of Maine and Sherman into a water refilling station for drinking, customer, for drinking containers, and fund the downtown building restoration program for businesses that lost funding in 2020 for facade improvements. The design committee is holding downtown's annual spring community cleanup day on Saturday, May 22nd from 9 a.m. to noon. Community cleanup day is for the cleanup of downtown and the surrounding area. If you're interested in volunteering, visit lebanondowntownassociation.com slash volunteering. Uh, in the downtown mural update, several building owners are on board. LBCC art students are signing up to volunteer with Lowe's Distribution providing the supplies. Currently, LDA is awaiting to hear back from current art commission members to act as art selection judges. For more LDA information, visit the Lebanon Downtown Association website or Facebook pages. Okay, we'll move into the public hearing. The purpose of this hearing is to invite public testimony regarding proposed utility rate adjustments for stormwater drainage, water, and wastewater. The public hearing is now open at 6.09 p.m. The Engineering Services Director will provide his staff report. Ron Whitlatch. Uh, thank you, Council President and Council. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
so everybody's favorite topic, right? Uh, rate increases, rate adjustments, however you want to frame it. Uh, each year we look at the utilities uh, and, and we uh, look to see what kind of inflation we're seeing throughout the utilities, mostly in terms of construction and staffing. Um, the way I've laid out uh, our, uh, the memo here before you is kind of a, a snapshot of what's going on in each of the three utilities. Uh, and I'll just kind of give you the highlights of those and, and why we're recommending that uh, a 3.1% increase to the utilities be done this year. So like, for instance, in water, uh, we just finished up the water treatment plant. Uh, we've got 29 years still to pay that debt service, which is roughly close to $1.2 million a year. Uh, so that's not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, we've got multiple large lines and small lines that still need to be replaced. Uh, we've got some undersized. Uh, we've still got asbestos cement and some old cast iron lines in the ground that are, you know, we, we see a lot of leaks in. Uh, so that's that's probably the primary reason there. And I'll kind of get into a little bit of what we're seeing in the construction side of this too, uh, once I get through uh, each of the three of them. Um, wastewater is probably the biggest challenge. Um, we've got a lot going on in wastewater. We have a mediation slash lawsuit with Jacobs um, that we're working through. We took over operations of the plant, we uh, the wastewater plant back in September. Um, that has required an extensive amount of, I'll call it capital maintenance that had not been done previously uh, to get the plant up to an operational standard where we can meet permit on a daily basis. Uh, we're still seeing uh, a pretty good amount of line failures, lateral failures. Uh, keep in mind, we have a lateral program in the city where uh, for residential uh, development, uh, if you have a failed lateral, the city pays for the portion within the right-of-way. Uh, the homeowner is then required to do their portion. Uh, but just to give you an idea, average cost in the right-of-way is about 7000 I think we're, we've got, oh, I want to say we're upwards of 25 or 26 people this year that have applied for the program in various stages of the program. So that's that's kind of it in, in wastewater. Um, you know, we're, we're getting ready to do our... Uh, Wastewater master plan, uh, we're working through contract negotiations with a, a consulting firm. And with that, uh, it kind of will parallel our uh, new MPDS permit, which is our discharge permit to the South Santa Ana River. Uh, that permit uh, is likely to have new, more stringent regulations. Uh, I can't tell you what it's gonna look like, but the two are gonna kind of be on a parallel path, uh, the, the new master plan, as well as uh, the new permit from DEQ. So, um, wastewater's wastewater's the tough one. Um, there's a lot of unknowns there, and there's a lot going on. So, uh, that's the reason for the 3.1 percent index uh, increase. Excuse me, increase for this year. Drainage, um, kind of the same thing. We have a relatively small um, drainage fee uh, in in regards to what 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 you can do with it. Um, a majority of ours goes to operations and maintenance. Uh, so what they do is they end up doing a lot of line cleaning, uh, small repairs. And uh, so we're just, just wrapping up the new storm drainage master plan as well. Uh, I hope to have that. Uh, I think we'll have it finished later this summer um, with uh, David Evans and Associates. Uh, we've seen a lot of the preliminary stuff. That'll have a capital component to it as well. Uh, and there is a ton of new stormwater regulation and post stormwater regulation that we're seeing um, that's going to come down the pike and all that's going to do is increase costs as well. So kind of back to where I led into this, the construction, uh, some of the construction costs we're seeing right now are, are crazy. Uh, and hopefully they, I, I mean, they're going to come back down at some point a little bit, but for the most part, they're not, they're not going to come down to what we saw several years ago. Uh, to give you an idea, some of the paving costs, uh, I just looked at some. Uh, last year, we were paying somewhere around you know, $80 a ton on the high end. And what we're seeing this year so far is in the 90s. Uh, that's a substantial increase uh, to uh, all, all of our utilities because you got um, 
you know, trench patching and things that go along with that, uh, we're seeing a major increase in pipe price. Uh, the resin plants in Texas were down for a while, and uh, there's a lot of people that aren't even able to get pipe right now, uh, just due to that fact. Uh, so what pipe you can get uh, is seen a dramatic increase. So uh, things, things are increasing. Um, I would tell you that the 3.1% is probably not going to keep up with inflation, uh, but it's at least a place to start and hopefully avoid anything big in the future. Um, you know, but that, that remains to be unseen with, with the regulations that are coming down. Uh, and the different policies that are coming out, uh, that's, there's potential there for, for some big projects and, and more costs. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Uh, I think everybody got a copy of where we were. Uh, we did a rate analysis over the last couple of days. Um, and hopefully everybody saw that. Uh, where we were on this list in 2017 was third highest. We're now fifth highest which I attribute to other communities having to do some of the same things that we're having to do, as well as um, we stayed on top of bar inflation through the inflationary increases over the last few years and uh, have prevented us from having to do big increases. So with that, we're kind of, we're recommending uh, the 3.1 inflationary index increase uh, across all three utilities. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Will this go into effect, Ron? I'm sorry? When will this go into effect? It's stated to go into effect in July 1. Ron, um, what, what have been our last increases the last few years? Because we've talked, I know there were times that I said <clears throat> that I advocated for at least like a 1% increase. And you were like, well, I don't really think we need it now. I know there were some years we were at zero. Yeah, I mean, there was years we were at zero, like in the water fund, where where things were where we outpaced uh, the inflation, so we were okay there. Uh, the last ones we did, I believe, were in 2019, uh, and that was just wastewater and uh, drainage. I believe, I believe we for, foregone the um, uh, water increase that year. Uh, I'll have to confirm that, but I'm I'm pretty sure that's how that went. And then we did not do any last year at all. Okay, and I'm going to clarify for people that don't understand when you were talking laterals. So the a lateral that goes between your house and the, and hooks up to the city, that's the homeowner's responsibility. But we several years back said we will have a program to come up with half of that money. And that when you said there's 25 people in the pipeline right now for that. Yes. So Throughout the, the course of this last year we've replaced probably 25 different laterals. They vary. I mean, you can have a lateral that's really deep and cost, uh, we've had some that are 20 to 25,000 uh, to replace. And then you get some that are on a fairly shallow system and our cost is, it could be three to 4,000. So it just varies and depends on where it's at. It's all, it's all a factor of depth. I just think, I, if, because if we stopped that program, then would we be able to save enough money to maybe only raise rates 2%. And we said, we just can't help you with your lateral. But I, I think that's part of that is a trade-off that people don't necessarily understand that somebody who cannot afford a 3.1% increase because they're on a fixed income also cannot afford a $6,000 lateral line replacement. And and that's really impactful that we all share a little bit of the of the lateral replacement. Yeah, it, it, it would be, uh, so we budget approximately $100,000 a year. There's years where we've spent 140 or 150 where we have to reach into our other capital funds. And uh, I, I'll tell you that if somebody comes and says, hey, my lateral is plugged and I, I, it's failed, um, we always find a way to, to get, it, uh, get them a new lateral uh, through either a contract uh, I mean, we've had years where we've even sent our crews out to make sure that they they have sewer service because um, that's the last thing we want is somebody to have to go without that. Ron, one question I had was um, I received a lot of comments about the new development in town and that impact. My question is, uh, we, we're seeing a lot of multifamily uh, homes go in and does the new development 
does it help to offset the cost? Does it hurt because it's requiring now more infrastructure and more maintenance? Can you kind of give us a little briefing on that? Well, so it's a, it's a double-edged sword, I suppose, uh, to a degree. I mean, what you're seeing now with the new development, the impacts of replacement of the infrastructure that they're putting in will be, I don't know, 50, 80 years down the road. Uh, the upside of that is the more rate payers you have, um, you know, that, that's probably Lebanon's biggest problem uh, is we have a very small rate base. Um, it'd be nice if you could say that, you know, your, your capital costs were a function of how many rate payers you had, but unfortunately that's not, not the case. The capital costs are fairly uh, uniform, whether you've got 15,000 accounts or whether you've got 6,000 accounts. Uh, we're still required to do all the same things, uh, you know. Uh, maybe our stuff's not quite as, as big as some of these other cities, but uh, overall, it, it, it has to do with the function of, of how many accounts we have and how, how many of those accounts you can spread those costs over. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, you're going to see increased um, replacement, but I, I wouldn't say that that's today. Uh, I would say that that's way out in the future. I mean, development pays their ways. They pay, they pay through SDCs. Uh, they have to extend and uh, put all the infrastructure in on them uh, as they develop. Uh, they're required, you know, we require hookup fees. Um, so I, I don't know that that's accurate, Jason, that, that development's causing an uptick and an increase to what we're doing. Now, if you look at the wastewater plant, um, yeah, I mean, you're in increasing uh, the amount that you have to treat there, but by and large, residential sewers, pretty minor. I um, mean, you could add another thousand houses and you really wouldn't even notice the difference too much at the wastewater plant just based on, on how it's treated, so. Thanks, I think there was, a lot of, there was some perception out there that developers weren't paying their fair share, that they were coming in and somehow the city was putting this stuff in for them at, at no cost to them. And, and I think it's important to point out that, that developers that come in and whether it's a subdivision or apartment complexes or or new business developments, they are paying the the system, the SDCs, the system development charges for that work. Absolutely. Thanks. Is there any way we can delay? You need to get on your mic so he can hear you. Is there any way that we can delay putting this into effect? Because we're in a COVID situation and there's a lot of pressure on a lot of people. And this is a kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back by increasing. I got a lot of comments from my. Yeah. Um, I'm going to give you the answer that I'm going to bring you what I think we should do. Uh, and and um, yes, we can delay, but something will. So let, let's let's take, for instance, we delay this year. I'm going to use wastewater. Water is not so. I mean, We'll just cut out a, another a project for line replacement, but wastewater this year uh, with everything that we have going on and all that we've had to spend out at the plant, I uh, would likely cut, you know, I'd have to talk to Jason about this to confirm, but we'd likely cut uh, some much needed repairs to the uh, clarifier arms uh, at the wastewater plant. Um, so can we baby them along? Yeah, probably. Um, but that said, if, something happens in a high event and one of those breaks, you know, we're in permit violation. Um, that's kind of your guys' call on whether we delay. I can tell you what the impacts of that delay are gonna be, but um, from, from my perspective as, as your engineer, I, uh, I feel it's important that I, I tell you what uh, the utilities are doing and what's needed there. And from there, if you wanna do something different, um, you know, we'll, we'll make it work, um, but I leave that decision to you. I think for those of us who have sat here from back in the day when we faced this issue with the water treatment plant, delaying only kicks the can down the road and you can only kick the can down the road so far. And previous councils back in the eighties and, and early nineties kicked the can down the road because they didn't want to increase fees. They wanted it to and rightfully so, they wanted to consider the impact on the, the citizens. But at, at the end, we ended up having to really hurt ourselves 
each customer with these massive increases uh, in order to get that project going, or we face the loss of, of our water system. And so I, I understand the, the impact, but I have a really hard time delaying the preventative maintenance, the things that need to happen. It's, it's the cost of doing business and we have to, we have to do it or we're, we're being negligent, in my opinion, we're being negligent in our duties as, as stewards of the public funds. Ron, you mentioned that, um, you know, we've moved down a couple spots. Have some of these other municipalities on the spreadsheet that I'm looking at in front of me, I don't know if that might be helpful for others to see, by the way, that may be watching, but have these other municipalities taken on um, similar capital projects like our water treatment plant that has led to them um, moving, I guess, further left on the on this sheet that I'm looking at? Yes. So Portland, um, I don't know how much you followed that. The Bull Run Reservoir, uh, they had no water treatment plant. Uh, it was a gravity pipe down to the system. They had a few pumps. I don't, I can't remember. I'm pretty sure they had to chlorinate, but I can't, I can't be a hundred percent sure. Uh, I believe the EPA and OHA came in and said, thou shalt build a new water plant. And that's what they're in process of. Same thing with Sweet Home. Um, their wastewater plant is too small. Uh, they built a water plant in, oh, it was a few years before we did. I can't remember the date, but so they've been through that process. And then you'll see that, you know, their wastewater rate's pretty high um, because they've got to put a bunch of upgrades into their uh, wastewater treatment plant. Um, the others, you know, we didn't, I, I didn't ask really all we did was, was pull data um, from the different ordinances or the different rate structures that other cities have. But my guess is they wouldn't be in any different boat than we are. Um, it's a pretty standard um, industry. So I would say that that's probably accurate. And I have one other question. Do we offer programs for um, maybe low income or uh, individuals that may have a harder time paying? Yes, we do. We do. I don't have the resolution in front of me. Um, I can. It's a ten percent reduction for yeah. who qualify for the state and federal LIHEAP, which is help with your electric and gas. <clears throat> if they come in with their letter that they've been approved for that per year, we give them ten percent off the call free rate. Okay. That's good for a year. They can come back and renew it a year. Okay. Do um, I'm sorry. I know I keep asking questions here, but uh, do we know how many people take advantage of that kind of program or can, is Matt that. on or is it? Okay. Okay. Thank you. If, if I may, yes. I, I think that um, I appreciate what Council Dexter asked. That's what I was going to ask as well. But based on the comments that we received, which a lot of them talk about the fact of the year that we have just had, but logically speaking, the infrastructure didn't wait for a year either. So we really have to not kick, kick the, you know, kick the can, as you mentioned. And I just wanted to clarify for those that are listening that, that we appreciate and understand that we have had a tough year and many have lost their jobs or reduced hours, but we still have to a city to run. And my question was gonna be um, what, what the impact would be if we waited a year for people to recuperate and I think the answer has already been given but based on from a looking at this past year point of view can we wait and you know the impact that you said we can but we suffer other issues if we do so it's just a comment I wanted to make from that point of view of the year that we've just had that's a good point and another good point is that the city was not unlike many small businesses and, and, and other businesses in the area. The city suffered decreases in revenue. The city suffered economic impact from the COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic as well. And so we are not in the same position we were in a year and a half ago, uh, and it, which makes it even more difficult to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do we still have a we at one point allowed people to uh, apply for uh, if they if they were affected by COVID, and we were making. Uh, is that still available? If not, we had at, at the time we we did that with the first round of federal funding, and that money had to be spent by December thirty 
Okay. So we did open that. We had, uh, I want to say we put $100,000 on the table with a max grant of $1,000. Matt and I both thought, you know, we're going to have a request for 150. I think we had 22 people, 23 people, something like that, ask for that assistance. We were stunned. We were calling customers who were past due, tell them it was, we worked with uh, uh, Central Ceramic Credit Union, super easy online application. All you had to be able to do was provide, here was some statement about your impact component, a layoff notice, unemployment benefit, or uh, we also opened it for people who were self-employed, so house cleaners, you know, who don't have clients to go to now, um, but but would not have a layoff notice because it's a right. private individual. We just didn't get the the demand for that money we had expected to get. And we did put that program out as helping you pay water, um, natural gas, and electric, and, and looking at how we could help. Because if, if, if you're hurting from paying us, you're probably hurting from paying the other ones too. We just didn't get the paper. Nancy, Councilor Steinhead will brought up a really good point about the, the assistance program that we have. And would it be possible for us to kind of as we as we may go forward with this to push that to the community again and have some sort of an awareness campaign that this is available if you want to come down and take advantage if you need it because um, again we don't want to kick the can on the road but here's an opportunity for you to to save some percentage on your on your rates because sure. i to be i'll be to be honest I, i've kind of forgotten about that i knew maybe but mm -hmm. it's a great point and we should we should push that a little harder probably sure. so. I'm gonna Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Um, can I pipe in for a second? I just wanted to answer uh, Councillor Steinhabel's question. So we have less than 60 customers a month that actually use that program. Um, and if I remember correctly, it is on most of our bills uh, highlighted in red that we have this program available. Um, we just don't have a lot of people that use it but we can come up with a different campaign to get that information out and uh, put something on Facebook and hopefully make it known. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Another yep. Um, I didn't know about the lateral program. I have a 110 year old house. I'm assuming mine's about ready to do. It's going to blow. Yeah, it's going to blow. It's going to go. But did we get, did you get the answer you're looking for? Is that a program that we can discontinue? Would that help? I think it puts more burden on the actual customer yeah. who, has to not my my point was less that I wanted to discontinue that and more that I wanted people to be aware that that is also where money goes so so yes we need to be sensitive to people who are not on a who are on a fixed income and our water is expensive we all pay that sure. by by the nature of living in town we all pay that and it hurts and there are people who are not able to do that I like I like that we have some assistance programs but but pay six to $25,000 for your lateral going is much more burdensome. And it's really important that we also fund some of these other things. Uh, to Jason's point, having a little bit of maintenance may cost us that 3.1% today, but it's gonna cost us how much in the long run because you didn't do maintenance. You gotta change the oil in your car and you, and you don't have the budget for that, but if you don't, you also cannot afford a new car. So that, that was a little bit more of my point was that's, a, that's an important fund that I don't think people know about. And I hope there are a lot of people listening to hear that. Right, I hope me so. too. I don't know how many are on. Any other questions for staff? So hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing at 6.33 p.m. And all for the discussion will be limited to council and city staff at this time. So does anyone have any else to discuss? I think most of it was carried out there in the public session, but I just don't want to see us go back to the 15 to 20 percent rate increases that we had to we had to do back in 2015, right. 2014. Right. Uh, that was a horrible, horrible time for us. I, when I, I first came on to city council in 2005. And this started becoming a, a conversation about our water, our water treatment plant is going to be, it could break any day and we, we don't have capital. And I asked, 
why do we not have and and it was the same answer nobody wanted to raise rates all those years it's not it's not very politically uh correct or it's not politically expedient to raise rates and everybody wants to be sensitive to the fact that nobody can afford that but you also have a responsibility they had a responsibility they neglected to raise rates enough to anticipate the capital needs yeah. and i wouldn't be part of that a, a part of that program again okay if there's no further questions i'll ask the city attorney to read the title of the first resolution Resolution number 2021-04, a resolution adopting the City of Lebanon stormwater drainage utility rates. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the first resolution. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Will the City Attorney read the title of the second resolution? Resolution number 2021-05, resolution adopting the City of Lebanon's water rates. Move for approval. Second. The motion is second for to approve resolution number 2021-05. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And will the city attorney read the title of the third resolution? Resolution number 2021-06, resolution adopting the city of Lebanon's wastewater rates. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the 2021-06. Resolution, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion carries. All right, we're gonna adjourn back into uh, regular session. Uh, item number two is the library card policy update presented by our library director, Kendra. Good evening, everyone. Um, Kendra Bowman here with the library. Can everyone hear me okay? Speak up. We're going to have Andy turn you up a little bit here. Hold on. Okay. Testing one, two, three. There we go. Is that good? Okay. Um, we're looking at six policies tonight. Four of them are changes to existing policies, amendments to existing policies, and two are brand new. And I believe you all have the, the actual policy on your iPads, and you can follow along and see the red line markup. The first one we're going to look at is on page six, and that is um, where we're um, adding the minimum age for children to apply for a library card. We're making that five years old. I have to tell you that in practice, we've been doing this for several years. My predecessor um, instituted this, and I didn't realize until I started reviewing the policy manual that it wasn't updated in the manual. Before there was no age limit, we just, um, it was a very arbitrary, you just need to be able to write your name. Some kids can do that at three and some are still struggling at six. And it's a moot point anyway, because the child doesn't even need to be here. A parent can apply for a card on their behalf. So it just makes it cleaner to just have a minimum age. And we decided five because that's the year they start school. And um, so the advisory board approved that. And um, we just need to see if you guys approve it. Any questions? No questions? I think you can go on and then maybe we'll get a motion at the end to accept all of them. Yeah, if we cover them all. Okay. All right. The next one is on page nine. And this is a completely new policy. Um, we have not had this type of library. Uh, a lot of libraries do, including the Albany Library. A member of the Lebanon School District um, came to me mid-pandemic and asked if this was something we had ever considered. Um, it was definitely on my periphery. I just, no one had asked for it, so um, hadn't really pushed forward with it. But, um, started looking into it a little more after they spoke to me and and I do think it's a really good idea. I'm sure you all know we are a city library funded by city property taxes. So if you reside outside city limits, you do have to pay a non-resident fee. That is $50 a year per household. That's obviously cost prohibitive for some families. Um, so we just wanna make this available for students. It would be limited use. Um, it's 
they're not they're not paying for this card in any way, so it wouldn't be fair to give them full access. Um, and we're and it's not going to be um, they won't be allowed to check out movies or games. It's strictly books, audio books, um, and then access to all of the um, electronic databases that the library has. Um, I did talk with um, library or with Albany quite a bit about their card, how they do it, and the pros and cons. They partner directly with the school district. So if you are a registered student in Albany schools, you automatically have a library card and you actually are allowed to use your student ID card. It took Albany quite a few years to work that out so that the barcode on the student ID was compatible with our software. Um, they also said they wish more students took advantage of it. Not a lot of kids use their student IDs as library cards. They also said, and this was um, a big factor for me, they, um, they get a lot of angry homeschool parents complaining because they don't get to take advantage of this. The way Albany does it, it's partnering directly with the school district. So it only benefits children enrolled in the school district. Also, it's a daily upload of the student registration files. Their IT person, because kids move in and out of district, so it's every day they have to do that. And you know, I don't want to add that burden onto our IT department. I also don't want to do it through the schools because I want there to be parental involvement. I think that's one reason Albany doesn't see as much use as they normally would. It it does no good to let anyone use their student ID for a card because in many cases they're minors, they need someone to bring them to the library and return their items to the library. There needs to be parental involvement. So um, I looked at a lot of other types of cards that other libraries do and um, my advisory board and I agreed that this would be the best type to offer. Um, and I got this really good quote. I don't think I need to tell you guys because I think you're all enlightened individuals anyway, but I thought it was a great quote. Equality has to do with giving everyone the exact same resources, whereas equity recognizes that each person has different circumstances and may need additional resources and opportunities to reach an equal outcome. So that's what we're trying to do, just provide equity um, so that all students can have access to reading materials. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, the next one is the very next page, page 10. And that's a very minor thing. Um, we rarely do passport cards anymore, um, but we did need to modify our policy because um, we only want it to be available. We'll only reciprocate with libraries that actually have um, um, expiration dates on their registrations. We had a person who came in to apply for a passport card and they used their home library card, but it was from 10 years ago and they no longer live there. Um, but that library did not have an expiration. So um, it's just a way to keep our, keep it fair. So that's that one. And the next one is on page 12. We started resource sharing um, quite some time ago. You guys approved that, I wanna say 2017. Um, but we, yeah, October, 2017, we just never got a policy written up about it. So that's just explaining how resource sharing works. Any questions on that one? Okay, and then the next one is all the way on page 24. And that has to do with um, holds. And again, this is one that we um, have been um, applying since my predecessor was here, it just didn't get updated. Um, we no longer charge for holds. You can place a hold for no charge. You will get charged if you fail to pick up the hold or cancel it. Um, other than that, we don't charge for holds. So that's just updating that policy. Any questions on that one? Okay. Um, and the last one is um, uh, just an update to our um, privacy policy. It used to be called just circulation records and it was basically saying um, we would not release information about the types of materials you read unless we were um, legally obligated to do so. 
However, the Oregon Library Association has a, has a list of um, public library standards and best practices and a privacy policy is, is recommended. So um, we just kind of made this a little more robust. We included portions of the original um, policy but expanded it. And again, we looked at um, dozens of other libraries, patron privacy policies and just kind of cherry picked the best parts um, out of them. And that's what we came up with, uh, my advisory board and I. And that was the last policy. All right, thank you, Kendra. Yes. Any questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I would move for approval on all the uh, changes. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the library card policy update. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Kendra. Thank you. Next item is the operation of the Arts Commission as a city function. That's presented by Community Development Director Kelly Hart. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Am I unmiked? Yep. Perfect. Um, so for those who were not on the, the council at uh, the time, in 2016, the, the city uh, created the Art Commission as part of a response out of the 2040 uh, vision plan. Um, that arts commission was created at the time when you had a, a city manager and support staff that were uh, quite passionate in the arts and had the, the knowledge base and the resources to, to operate it. Um, and at the time of uh, the creation of it, the uh, city manager was identified to be the chairperson of the commission. Um, with the understanding that uh, that was to be for the first year, uh, and then the mayor would adopt, would appoint a new uh, chair uh, for the, the future. Um, however, upon appointment uh, until uh, his uh, vacancy of his city manager position, the, the previous city manager was the, the chair. Um, at that point in time, the uh, support staff, which was our communications coordinator, um, Ms. Falk, uh, took over the chair position. And then she uh, since left the organization as well. And that was our brain trust for the Arts Commission within the city personnel side of the equation. Um, at this point in time, we currently have Alicia Rogers, the economic development catalyst. Uh, taking on the um, support for the Arts Commission, as well as her additional duties. And uh, if you all don't know, at this point in time, she is also on maternity leave, um, enjoying her new baby boy. So um, we have a, a bit of a void in the staff support for the commission at this point in time. Um, but that may be okay, uh, because if you look at the staff report that, that was provided, we do analyze the uh, strategic plan and the vision plan with the goals and action items for it. And uh, in those few years that the Arts Commission has been uh, alive, uh, there was quite a few items that have already been accomplished on that list. Um, there's a couple of items that were taken over by the Downtown Association. Um, and there's a couple of items that the city has worked on individually, such as putting together the entry monument um, and sculpture there. Um, and the biggest accomplishment I think was associated with the, the construction of the Strawberry Plaza. Um, but I think if you look at all of the strategies and all of the goals associated with the Arts Commission, it is all focused on the city's downtown area. Um, there, there is, I think, the, the film festival is, is one of the few items that would be outside of downtown's jurisdiction. Um, and, and so there's kind of a, a symbiotic relationship that currently exists with the Arts Commission and the Downtown Association. Um, Cassie Cruz, the downtown manager, is also on the Arts Commission. Um, and, and so there, there's already an existing function of the Downtown Association connected with it. Um, so in terms of funding of the Arts Commission, as part of the ordinance and as part of the strategic plan and endowment fund was to be created, um, that 
has not yet been created. And so what the Arts Commission has been funded by was an initial seed fund through the city. And then they have been generally operating under, um, in terms of revenues received, a, a balanced budget uh, based off of the, the quirky turkeys and um, some donations. And they did a calendar fundraiser and then the art board um, program as well. Uh, but the funding does not truly capture the, the financial soft costs that the city incorporates as part and, and pro, uh, provides as part of the commission. Um, we had the, the maintenance crews and the IT department, as well as pretty much the full-time operation of the communications director that was manning the arts commission over the past couple of years. Um, the maintenance department had a heavy hand in building all of the stands for the quirky turkeys and then having to coordinate the um, placement of them in the morning and then removal of them in the evening every day. Um, and then the IT department helps with all of the summer events in the Strawberry Plaza. And, and that's not, that has not been truly accounted as a art commission expense, but is a, a city's function that takes the time. And so that hasn't um, been fully evaluated as part of the commission in the past, but is something to be discussed tonight. Um, but essentially moving forward, um, the, the purpose of the conversation, how we wanted to bring it forward to you is a, a peer recognition of the lack of the brain trust associated with it for staff support at this point. Um, we, we don't have anybody that's in the art field. Um, I personally can't pick up a paintbrush. Um, and so you probably don't want me running the Arts Commission, um, but we would have to have a discussion of, of what is the expectation of city staff's operation within the Arts Commission at this point, um, how the Arts Commission is to be continued to be funded, um, and, and then there's the First Amendment and, and legal framework that we would want to also discuss if the goal is to keep the Arts Commission as a city function. Um, we currently, uh, in my evaluation of the Arts Commission, do not have a single policy in place about the decision criteria process for accepting art board submissions. Um, it is up to the Arts Commission as a whole to vote on the, the decision. Um, and, and there's there's no clear cut criteria for them to ensure that First Amendment protections are being considered and, and there's a, a clear decision criteria. And so that would have to be something that if it stays as a city function, uh, we would need to have our city attorney take a, a detailed look at and, and move it forward. Um, so as part of the staff report, I give a couple of suggestions uh, of how to move forward with the Arts Commission. Uh, number one is since the absolute vast majority of it lies within downtown and, the, and benefits the downtown area, that we work with the downtown association to house it within their organization. And we can still provide a staff liaison um, to assist with permitting processes and, and making sure that there's that coordination with the city. Uh, the other option that we've come up with is much like what occurred with the museum um, ad hoc committee is to transition the arts commission to a, a self-sustaining board eventually, just like the museum ad hoc committee transitioned into its own foundation. Um, or we maintain it as a city commission, and then we have to get into the legal conversation about creating those decision criterias, and then have a understanding of what those roles and responsibility expectations of city staff would be. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking for on terms of guidance. I, of course, can answer any questions that you might have to the best of my ability, but I would leave the discussion up to you at this point. Thank you, Kelly. Thoughts? So they do not have a board. There's a commission. The commission. What, Kelly, do we know what the current makeup of this commission is? Um, I know that it includes Alicia as the, the chair. You have Cassie Cruz as uh, a member of it. And then 
the commission is supposed to be inclusive of people within the arts community. Um, but I know that we've had some difficulties of you know, gaining traction of getting a full commission and, and maintaining those. And as I am rambling on here, I'm trying to get to the directory that says who's on it. Thank you. I believe yeah. there's no vacancies. There are still vacancies? Not that I there know. Are. No, that's no, all last okay. time I looked. It's probably the only commission that's always fully, you know, everybody wants to be on it. I mean, from what I've seen. Um, so we do have a full commission at this point, but I do from understanding and speaking with Alicia understand that a, a few of them have identified an interest to not continue their term in this next cycle. I mean, I, I support, I support the arts commission. I think it's an, I think it, it plays an important role in our community as a whole. I don't know that the city and the city staff members need to be the primary means of um, facilitation of the arts committee. And so if there's a more amiable way for us to keep the commission alive and, and support it as an organization, but free up our maintenance, and those are things I never thought of, maintenance and the picking up and dropping off and all those things that go along with it, uh, if that could be distributed to other members of another group, I think that would be the best for the city. But curious your thoughts. Yeah, I agree. I think um, I think it definitely they've done a lot of great things and a lot of exciting things and a lot of things that help help bring excitement to the city, but at the expense of a lot of city staff. And if we could support it as a part of the downtown association, I would like to see that. If the downtown association could take that on and have maybe their liaison and Kathy, Cassie, our liaison it to, in uh, Alicia to keep track of and be sure that we're still supporting them, but have it be their commission. Um, I would like us to see go in that direction. Let's, let's I'll support that. Yeah. I like that. I actually didn't have a problem with the, the soft costs per se that were described, but I do think that if there's not leadership within the city, you know, it really was created. Having been a part of those 2040 conversations, it really was a created based on the previous city manager's vision for art in our community. And with that um, linkage gone, I can understand why it, it's, it's having a, yeah, it's floundering maybe a little bit. And I, I don't want to say that as the people on that commission, are, clearly the Strawberry Plaza is beautiful and they've done some very good work, but um, I would like to see it also in a more permanent home like the Downtown Association as well, um, if that's something they're willing to take on. Yeah. So. Well, the way I see the, the commission is that as part of a larger vision um, you, you mentioned that you're not an artist, and I don't see that commission as being a function of art, but a function of opportunity for tourism, opportunity to bring fun and, and items that are actually important to our community, because we do need art, we do need music, and we do need, you know, the artistics uh, in our community, and they help in other ways. You know, like, I remember when I was driving down to look for a place to live, I saw Strawberry Plaza and I found interest in it. And I found beauty in it. And I saw that people cared. Mm -hmm. um, the mural project, I think that's a fantastic idea, especially uh, when people are judging our own and saying, hey, you know what? This is fantastic art. Let's put this up on the wall so that people driving by will want to stop at Walmart, will want to stop at McDonald's, will want to stop at the store and take a look. So I think it's really important for it to have a home I think it's important for us to see it as part of a larger vision and not just just the art. And I do know that there is a cost associated with it and that has to be looked at. I do like the the, the marriage of those two entities. I happen to be on the board of, of LDA and I know how hard they work. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, the problem is it's a small group. And I know that the, com the committee is a little bit larger but if the interest is dwindling, then how can we infuse 
uh, more blood, more body, more, more breath into it. And I don't know if it's a matter of it costing us more, but putting more thought into it and bringing some interest to it. I don't know. Well, it's definitely a passion project, you know, and, and it was Gary's passion and that showed and a lot of great things have come from that commission and from that passion project. But to Kelly's point, if you don't have a person in the right, it, you know, we're all on the, on the same bus. Yeah. It's about getting the right people on the bus, which we've got, but now we gotta get the right people in the right seats so that we're, we're moving in the right direction and everyone's playing the right role. And, and if you're not passionate about the arts, mm -hmm. that's not gonna be your jam. So <laughs> um, I, I agree that the transition to maybe a partnership with LDA would be great. And eventually maybe they separate off and become their own entity, but, yeah. um, well, is this is this the first time that um, it's really come up? It's the first time it's really come up for the public, I think, to be aware that the Arts Commission is maybe having some leadership struggles, I'll say. So is it something we have to make a decision on tonight? Can we give it a, a month and then come back to it and see if anyone actually comes forward and says, yo, I'm an artist. I love this stuff. It's my jam. What can I do? Yeah. I mean, I don't, are they having leadership issues truly, or is it just more of maybe maybe we're the having people. the issue as a city right <laughs> our leadership has changed yeah. and that changes the dynamics of our involvement i don't want to discount the arts commission at all no, because, i don't want yeah. to either and, and i should note so miss Bach's position doesn't exist anymore um frankly i don't have time to lead a, a commission and and i'm even worse with the paintbrush than kelly might think she is so it is it is not it, it is something that i think is important in the community but it's not my passion and, and I and I feel like maybe not necessarily appropriate for the city to lead this group so much as to be in that liaison position of providing information and then you know coming back from the meeting talking to Jason about you know the next thing that that we want to do where where does the maintenance operations group fit into this this workload that's coming and can we accommodate it um, yeah. That liaison, I think, is is going to be critical. Um, but if if uh, if LDA would be interested in taking this on, and it's something that we could uh, uh, work with them in terms of making that transition, I, I agree. I don't think I don't think we need a decision tonight, but some guidance in terms of, of where you want us to go, and if you want us to talk to LDA about it, um, then I think we're, we're happy to take that. That direction. Well, it sounds like the consensus of council is to maybe approach that, uh, approach the LDA and, and pitch that and see what that would look like moving forward. If they're open to it, if they have the means to do it, uh, that would help us in that decision. Except so we need to reach out for leadership within the community via the city and the LDA. Uh, and there may be people out there that would step up. So I yep. think you nailed it on the head when you said it was a passion project and, and what I guess I'm looking and not trying to knock leadership on this commission at all, but I, I haven't uh, seen who that new passion person is, as was the previous person that was, you know, as was Gary. Well, that that was really his Gary. jam. <laughs> yeah. Gary, so. Gary took on probably too big of a bite for a city manager, but he did it knowing that he could handle it exactly. and he needed to be that person to do it to get this thing off the ground and moving forward. Uh, and so it makes sense to to step back from a new program after a couple of years, reevaluate it and, you know, readjust your planning piece so that you can move forward with it in a, in a better way. So in our discussions around 2040, we we are, we know that it's important to the diversity of the city of Lebanon to have an arts commission. Yes, I agree. Kelly, do you have something? Yeah, so I just wanted to, to throw it in here because I don't want it to make it sound like the, the people on the commission themselves have, have no leadership. It's fully and completely within me and Alicia and, and, and Nancy, as she's admitted, of not having the time or uh, the knowledge or the, or the passion for it. I, I think also the, the passion was held so greatly within our predecessors um, that they did not ask for the commission members to take on the the heavy lifting side of the equation of the arts commission and so it, it's not necessarily that they don't have the leadership it's just that they haven't been previously asked to do so 
um, through the predecessors. And then pretty much when we took it over, uh, we had one meeting and then COVID hit and haven't had a meeting with the commission since because of COVID. Um, and so there hasn't been the opportunity to create that transition, but we did feel it was appropriate to have the discussion about what is the ultimate goal of the Arts Commission, knowing that city staff doesn't have the, the time or knowledge basis to take the heavy lifting anymore. Um, the, the communications coordinator had identified that approximately 85% of her time was to implement the Art Commission's um, you know, projects and, and manage those. Um, and we don't have the capacity to do that at the city staff level at this point with, with who we have. Um, and so that's where the discussion spurs from. Okay. The other side of the equation is if it continues to be that city function, then we do need to clean it up and create some policies and decision criteria in terms of how you are judging art uh, and making sure that you're not impeding on First Amendment rights. And so, um, that's the, the conversation of how LDA came up and on board. I know that Cassie has a passion for it. Um, and so we'd be happy to take on those conversations with her. Uh, I, I think the consensus is that um, have staff entertain that with uh, LDA and then maybe come back to us in a month or two and, and let us know where things are at and what you found. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Can I interrupt for a minute? Kendra um, wanted to mention one more thing. Sorry, everyone, I forgot. Um, when I sent all the information off for your packets, there was a change in one of the policies um, and it was the, the non-resident student card. One of the things that they were not going to be allowed to do, the very last thing was check out materials from consortium libraries. Um, it turns out, I just found out yesterday after talking with Albany that it would be really difficult to prevent that. So um, we're just gonna go ahead and let that happen. Um, it's, it's not a big deal, um, but anyway, just wanted to clarify. I forgot to mention that, that that changed after your packets got sent out. And then I should also say, um, now that you have approved this, um, there's going to be have to be some back end work um, with Albany and also with our own um, IT department. Casey is going to have to change the GIS maps so that staff can verify who is in the school district area. So it'll be a couple months before the cards will actually become available. So I just want to clarify that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, moving on to number four, it's still Kelly with the city grant funding through the budget process. Uh, yep, so this one came up because in uh, our February meeting, I think it was, the Downtown Association provided a presentation about the actions of the previous year and their goals for the next year. And they included a financial assistance ask to the city. Um, at that point in time, there was no discussion or action on that ask uh, by the council to incorporate it in the budget. And so at the staff level, we were going through the budget and identified that there's a couple of other organizations that also have um, in the budget, we've identified them as city grants. Um, and so we wanted to bring the conversation to council um, to identify as we move forward in the budget process, whether we should um, maintain budgeting for uh, these uh, certain businesses. And then if we want to establish a, a program or a policy of how to uh, allow for other grant applications to occur as well. Um, so right now, under the current fiscal year, we have grants for Boys and Girls Club, Meals on Wheels, the Lynn Shuttle, and the Small Business uh, Development Center. Um, the LDA is also included in that grant, but it is uh, funded out of the lodging tax, um, as well as a contract with the Chamber of Commerce to disperse other grants uh, through that uh, lodging tax fund as well. Um, so the question before council tonight is to uh, provide us with direction on these grants. We do have, uh, as updated from the staff report, Meals on Wheels did submit a request for funding um, that was not previously accepted at, uh, in hand at the time of the writing the staff report. Uh, so we would like to have direction from council on whether or not to budget for these grants. Um, and either direct staff to include a maximum grant uh, without identifying specific funded, 
and then authorize a city manager to identify the grant recipients uh, or specify the organizations to receive the grants as part of the budget and establish a process for considering other grant re uh, requests in future budget cycles or an alternative that you all decide on. So with that, I'll conclude my report. Yeah. We used to get grants when I was first on council, grant applications for uh, the tourism funds. And that's when we finally uh, handed that over to the Chamber of Commerce because that was taking up inordinate amounts of time and we weren't uh, a tourism body. So that was really inefficient. I like the idea of having kind of a more formal process of what kind of grants that that you, we, we direct you to do. Um, I like that we're addressing it like this. I agree. I like the idea of a maximum grant budget um, and then asking staff to, to establish a process to identify those recipients. Yeah. Also, do these grants, that some of these I'm looking at, them. do we um, lease property to these organizations as well? Is that encompassed in the grant? I'm, I'm thinking of the Boys and Girls Club in particular, or maybe even Meals on Wheels in terms of the Senior Center and the Boys and Girls Club with the old library property. Uh, I know that the Meals on Wheels operates out of uh, the Senior Center, uh, but I believe they operate out of the Senior Center for free. But, uh, and this is just a, in addition to the facility as an overall operation of the Got it. organization. In addition, the Boys and Girls Club does lease the old library, and I believe we lease it to them for a dollar a year. Okay. So I guess my question is, are the same, is it the same agencies every year that are putting in for the same grant funds? Is that what we're seeing? Or do we see different agencies, different requests come through? So, and Matt, jump in if you would like here, but um, these have been recurring grants that, that have been part of the, the budget um, for a period of time. The SBDC is a fairly um, new grant that was just from two cycles ago when I first started, um, but we've actually incorporated that into the economic development budget within my department to provide specific services, so that wouldn't be considered a grant uh, anymore. Um, but we also haven't identified that the city is open to uh, accepting grants. And so it, there's not a, pol a procedure in place to say we will accept grant requests within this time period. Um, and so I'm not sure if there's a, a knowledge base to other organizations that that's available. Um, but it was just a, a conversation to be had of if we do this, then should it not be known to other organizations and have it be a decision-making process of who to provide funding for. I agree. I think if yeah. you're if you're just budgeting to distribute every year, we're really just subsidizing. We're not we're not giving grants out. And so it, I think it would be important for us to make sure that there was equity amongst the community and the groups in the community to have some sort of ability to apply mm -hmm. and more or less battle for the grants. But and maybe maybe the same five will still apply, no one else, but and if that's the case, great. But if there's a maximum set, we have a budgeted amount. Um, there may be some great program that pops up that uh, isn't aware of this because no one's ever told them, like you said. So, mm -hmm. Also, I think if we open Pandora's box, it's going to require a lot of staff time to handle that. As far as new grant requests? Yeah, reading them and doing the research. Yeah, and that's kind of what Rebecca talked about and the problem the council had before. Um, yeah. Point of clarification: This is just to to set a um, a process together, not necessarily to set a budget yet. Correct. 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 We are we are at the point um, we we hope to be distributing budget documents next week to the budget committee. Um, and so if it's something that you wish to have included in the budget to be appropriated and spent next fiscal year, we kind of need some idea about how much you want us to put in 
Um, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to decide on a specific app at this point, but do you want us to budget 10,000, 15,000, 20,000? And, and that sets the, the max. You can agree to give nothing at this point, and we can bring this back for additional discussion about what the guidelines would be. So I don't, you have to be a 501c3. And, uh, I don't, even, kind of I don't recall what we've been budgeting. Well, and, and I feel like we're since we're distributing budget documents, this may be a little late in the game to change this this year. And maybe we go forward with this is this is how we've done it, but we need to have a formal process. We need to we need to talk about budget maximums. We need we need more time so that by budget process next year, we've not only we've given these organizations a little preparation to say you're gonna you, you're gonna be doing you're going to be competing for these funds and here's a, the guidelines and here's what you're going to be doing. I don't know. It just seems to me a little late in the game to, to tackle it. I don't, I don't know. I mean, we've gotten a letter now from Meals on Wheels and they're only asking for 4,000 for next year instead of 15. I've not heard from Boys and Girls Club or the Lynn Shuttle Service to know if these were specific one-time asks or if these are things that have been ongoing contributions in under some kind of a long-standing agreement that the council has had to, to fund these programs, which is which is why we're asking, what what do you Kelly hasn't been here long, I've been here even shorter. So uh, Matt hasn't been here forever. So kind of what's the what's the history of it and, and what should we be doing? Uh, again, you know, we haven't put any asks out. We did not contact these people and say, do you still want money or expect money next year? In, in part because I think, I mean, who's going to say no? I don't want money next year. Right. Um, and that's the, the thing I, that, I, that concerns me. And the more I think about it now, I begin to have a real issue with the use of public funds to, I understand the tourism grant because that to me is, um, we are, they're putting on events that are drawing in the tourism and the tax from that motel stay is can only be used can only that. be used for that and it's it's funneled back in and so that is a clean slate but when we're talking about general fund dollars um nonprofit. for nonprofits or for projects or for whatever is requested by whatever business or or nonprofit uh i start to i start to have a moment to pause over that and is that the right thing to do and is that is that being a good steward of public funds I think if you're going to do that, it would be beneficial to have a policy on yeah. mm -hmm. on what criteria that nonprofit has to meet. Uh, you know, is, is there a is there a public benefit in their service? Are they, um, you know, are they achieving some goal that that the city would have for them? Uh, you know, and and set some criteria that would let us say if you ask to be funded. You have to tell us how you meet these criteria before we consider it. Um, I, I still don't think any of that would require, you know, putting out an invitation to all Lebanon to come in and apply for money. Um, but but having criteria that would help us understand is what the council would like to have included in the budget or not. The alternative is, you know, you get the request in the middle of the year. And there aren't appropriations, and then there's kind of a scramble for where do you where do you find appropriations? If these are things that the council by policy supports having the city fund, and that's really where I think we're trying to to get an understanding. I don't know if I'm ready to decide if I really want the city to fund that, uh, especially when we're talking about we're putting rate increases out there, and we're t we're telling the public that we can't we need more money to do this, but we're gonna distribute grant funds to do that, uh, it begins to, it begins to seem hypocritical uh, for us. Um, I, you know, Shelly had a great, they had, there's a mini grant program at the chamber, it's probably still there, right? Yeah. Where uh, you can put in for a grant and, and, and I did that through the fire department because we had a project come up mid-year, we didn't have funding for it. And so this opportunity came up and Shelly was very clear in that, yeah, you can put in for this. You can put in for, you know, the, the $5,000 that you want, but you're going to get it one time and it's got to be seed money. It's got to create something that will be self-sustaining. You have to have a plan for the future of it. This, this is not going to be every year you come back for another five grand. And so 
whether that's addressed through policy is one question, but whether it's still the right thing to do with tax dollars to me is another question. Okay, so so can I, uh, I'm gonna try and pull this together. Um, would you agree that we would reestablish funding for LDA out of lucky tax money for $25,000? That, that is what I think has happened in the past uh, until pandemic <clears throat> hit. Do we have that kind of revenue in that fund or are we? I, I think Matt, I think we are projecting to have that kind of revenue for next year. Okay. So, so uh, the LDA would be good. Um, do you wish us to go forward with the Boys and Girls Club, the Lynn Shuttle at their previous request and then Meals on Wheels at 4,000 until we can work through some policy direction for fiscal 22-23 and a process for that. Yeah, I wouldn't be in favor of cutting these these groups off at the knees when they're expecting, if they're expecting funding, that's also part of the problem I have though, is that now we're expecting yeah. funding. Uh, and so we need to, we need to probably fund what is expected right now, but mm -hmm. come up with a plan to next year. I don't think we fund these annually i i feel i i don't have a recollection but i feel like the boys and girls club was probably a one-time <clears throat> shot i don't remember that coming back every year so i think we should probably pencil that out in case in case we're wrong i think it's a little late in the game again to 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 uh cut that off but we need to we need to have a date certain and we need to have a process and we need and when you were talking about we're raising rates, I just want to clarify that the water is it's an enterprise fund. fund. That's it. It's, it's an enterprise fund, and people don't understand that. So what we're talking about <clears throat> wouldn't wouldn't ever affect your water rates. No. Period. No. Uh, and there are still programs that come from the general fund and things that come from the general fund yes. that, that will be sacrificed. That is true. I just wanted to clarify that for this evening because we we're talking about rates. We're talking about about different funds and the tourism funds that come from the hotel taxes. That also is not general fund money, and that has to go for a tourism uh, uh, project. So anyway, yeah. As long as we're clear. question for Matt. How many years have we been funding them, these four? I think they've been funded every year since I've been here and before that as well. The Boys and Girls Club, we, we fund 6,000 a year? Yes. I didn't remember that. I think Chris went to Gary. That did not come to city council. Huh. I, I don't know that city council has ever weighed in specifically. I know this is a conversation I've had with with Nancy and Kelly that are we going to ask if these should just continue as is or uh, Gary said, yeah, just keep them in there. So yeah. I followed his direction. We need a Okay. Yeah, that gives us some direction, and I, and I will I will put in a call to the Boys and Girls Club and and Lynn Shell or, or or Kendra and see what she knows about those to see if they still expect that money or if, if we have some kind of agreement that we're funding uh, electric bills or something at, at the Boys and Girls Club. I, I don't really know the I don't really know what we're funding uh, and see if we can get some more information. And, and then put that together. So, thank, thank you. That uh, sounds good. You good? Uh, number one, I was going to say if, if LDA does come to a vote, I'd have to abstain since I'm on that board, but I do support uh, them being funded. Uh, but I just wanted to step back for a moment and not necessarily a caution, but a consideration that if we're talking about LDA and one of the committees combining, that we keep that in mind as well, that that may become an issue that we need to work through but I'm fully in support because of the work that they do and because of, of the movement of, you know, touristic type projects and interesting type projects that bring people to town that we fully figure out a way to support the ideas of moving forward with uh, some, type of, some type of collaboration or maybe not a collaboration, but a resurgence of both those committees. We're so obviously great. gonna need more money at some point. Looking that way. <laughs> So you got good direction on that, Nancy? All right, thank you. Thanks, Kelly and Matt. Uh, with that, move on to number five, uh, awarding the construction manager general contractor services for the Westside Sewer Interceptor Phase 5 project, number 18707, presented by Ron Whitlatch. 
Thank you, Mr. Council President and Council again. Um, so back in December of 2020, uh, we requested Council approval to do an alternative bid delivery for the Westside Interceptor project uh, in the form of what we call a CMGC construction manager, general contractor. Uh, we'll, uh, we advertised uh, for proposals in February. Uh, so basically it's not just a low bid, it's a conglomeration of experience, project approach, um, percentages of markup. Um, there, there's quite a few things that pieces that go into it. Uh, we received six proposals from very well-qualified firms. Um, we had city staff, we had our uh, two consulting firms, David Evans and Associates and Udell Engineering review and score the proposals. Um, Emory and Sons Construction came out on top uh, from all six scorers, um, without a doubt. Uh, we've had initial meetings with them. In fact, we've done uh, a lot of pre-planning to get in going on the pre-construction phase services of this project. All that means is that they're going to do a constructability review of value engineering and give us some real-time pricing. Um, and then we would come back for the big uh, contract amendment. That's how you do uh, CMGC is you amend the contract with the what the guaranteed maximum price will be. And we'll do that here this, um, hopefully by June. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, but with that, we're recommending that uh, council approve a motion to award the contract to Emory & Sons Construction for the pre-construction phase services. I can answer any questions. Questions for staff? I'm going to entertain a motion. So moved. Second. The moved and seconded to award the, award the construction manager general contract services uh, Westside Interceptor Phase 5 project. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, Ron. Yep. Why do you stick around for number six? Okay. The Filter Belt Press Procurement Contract Project number 21702. Thanks again. Uh, so this is for a new filter belt press uh, for the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, back in February, we requested approval to advertise uh, for the procurement since it was going to be over the 100,000 mark. Uh, you've got to go through a formal uh, process, just same as you would with a construction project. Um, we got bids back on the 25th of March. We got four different bidders. Uh, they ranged... <laughs> You see how they ranged. Uh, one of them was was disqualified for not using uh, the standard forms and uh, failing to do a couple of other things with theirs, but they were on the high end. Um, or tech um, out of Ohio was the lowest quote provided uh, for this. And there is no contract that goes with this. It's strictly a um, we're going to do it off of an, uh, a purchase order. Uh, but with the price being over the threshold of the city manager approval, uh, we need council approval. And we are re recommending that uh, you award that procurement contract in the tune of $169,950. I can answer any questions about that. So moved. It's been moved and seconded to award the filter, press, filter belt press procurement contract. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. All right, uh, agenda item number seven, amending the Lebanon Muni Code chapter 3.04 of public contracts presented by interim city manager, Nancy Brewer. Thank you. Um, uh, this actually came about because as I started, I uh, had several department directors asking me whether or not I needed to sign contracts or, or invoices because they didn't know what authority they had. The code um, actually says that uh, uh, I have certain purchasing authority that doesn't have to come to council and I can delegate that to a department director, but uh, that's supposed to be in writing and we don't have that in administrative policy. So as I dug into this, um, I saw some places where I thought we could improve some efficiency in our procurement processes. Part of that is aligning uh, when we come to council to authorize initiating a bid and, and then awarding bid, much, much as we just did, that we match 
that dollar value will for state law says we have to do a formal procurement. So moving how many council at 100,000 to moving to 150,000. I think it just makes it a little bit cleaner for staff that if we're a council, a formal procurement will be required. Um, and then uh, trying to uh, remove some language. You see, I took all of the definitions out. I don't think there's a legislative session that they don't change the state law for public procurement. And so trying to take some of the more detailed language out of our code means we don't have to go through after every legislative session and tweak it to match up with whatever has happened. Um, and then there's, there's just some minor changes to try and clarify and simplify some of the language around um, what the city manager delegations are. There was some redundancy in language or things that didn't quite move the same way. So those are proposals that I, I put on the table. If you approve this, uh, then that means I can start working on uh, or finalize an administrative policy that makes it clear to each department director kind of what their purchasing authority is uh, associated with uh, items that are in the budget. Uh, and I would say the last thing that we um, would like to be able to do is include as part of the budget document um, and a probably is attachments to the budget message. Here are the planned purchases for next year that are over $150,000. When the council adopts the budget, that would authorize initiating the bid. So we wouldn't come to you and say, can we initiate this bid and now award this bid? We would just come in at, at the point that we budget $250,000 for a replacement factor. You've seen it in the budget, you've approved in the budget, I, I would like us to not have to come in and say, Matt, can we go bid for it? But instead, we would come in and say, we have bid for it, award. That makes yeah. me want to kiss you. Thank you. Uh. I'll take that. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Let's socially do um, so, so those are just some recommendations I'm bringing in to try and, and clean that language up. I think that's great. Any, anything for efficiency and effectiveness is awesome. So. Thank you. Any questions? City Attorney will read the ordinance. Uh, ordinance Bill number 2021-06, Ordinance number 2962, a bill for an ordinance amending Chapter 3.04 of the Lebanon Municipal Code Public Contracts. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve Ordinance Bill number 2021-06, Ordinance number 2962. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ordinance is approved. Uh, number eight, update on House Bill 2001 and the impacts to the city's zoning regulations presented by Kelly Hart, Community Deve Development Director. Hello again. Uh, so this presentation was originally scheduled for the second meeting in March um, that we ended up not having. So uh, I'm not going to go through the, des the design considerations because that was considered before the Planning Commission and we have a hearing for the adoption process to begin next week uh, for House Bill 2001. But I did want to at least have a conversation with council to uh, identify what we are required to do um, and then at least report out on what the Planning Commission has directed staff to incorporate as part of the proposed ordinance and get any um, red flag considerations that you might have. Uh, so first and foremost, what House Bill 2001 says is that medium-sized cities, which equates to 10,000 to 25,000 people population, must allow a duplex to occur in the same manner that you do a single family home in any residential zone. Um, so that is inclusive of all of our residential zones as well as the mixed use zone. Now for every single property that can do a single family home, a duplex can do the same in the same manner. Um, the most contentious part of what that same manner means is the parking standards. Um, the state has interpreted the same manner to mean uh, for a single family home, if you apply a two parking space per dwelling unit standard, you shall apply a two parking space standard for the duplex as a whole. And so that equates to one parking space per unit. So essentially a 50% reduction in the parking requirements. It also identifies that for accessory dwelling units, which we currently do require parking for, uh, we are no longer allowed to uh, apply parking standards to accessory dwelling units. Um, 
aside from that, uh, the state had requirements for the city to consider incentives for uh, providing affordable or middle housing. Um, those and incentives to be considered are uh, waiving or deferring SDC charges um, for the construction of duplexes or affordable housing, um, considering a, a, a reduced property tax requirement or uh, an exemption of property taxes for these housing types, or to establish a construction excise tax on every building permit um, that is issued to then develop a fund for the city to then provide grants or services for affordable housing or to purchase property for the purposes of affordable housing. Um, those considerations were presented to the Planning Commission. Um, the Planning Commission indicated that there was no interest in the construction excise tax uh, due to that having to create a new system within the city to be able to um, do so, and then that just adds to construction costs for all uh, building construction. Um, but they did identify a, a desire for staff to come back at a future date to further discuss uh, modifications for SDCs and also the uh, property tax exemption option. Um, so outside of those required functions, the, the state does let us um, have some design control. Uh, and so the, the state requires duplexes in the definition to be an attached duplex. So what we currently do now, um, but they do say you could also allow for a detached duplex, which for all intents and purposes would look like two single family homes that are detached on a single pro property at that point in time. Um, the planning commission debated this uh, at great length um, and there wasn't a, a direct consensus about what would be appropriate to allow the attached products or the impacts of allowing the detached product. And so the ultimate direction that was uh, requested of staff is to draft the ordinance to only allow for attached at this point to meet the requirements of the house bill. And then through our pending comprehensive plan update process, do a further evaluation of different housing types that would be appropriate to accommodate in that overall greater decision making process. Um, they also uh, encouraged providing an incentive for additional parking to be provided on site. So a five foot rear setback reduction is proposed um, that would reduce it from 20 feet to 15 feet in exchange for providing additional parking on the property behind uh, above the minimum. Um, and other than that, the, the code is fairly simple. Um, we already pretty much complied with the, the House Bill 2001, uh, other than parking standards and minimum lot size standards. And so what the code is being presented to the Planning Commission incorporates those recommendations from them from the work session, um, and then just code cleanup in terms of providing a consistent language. Um, and so unless uh, the council has direction that would contradict that direction, um, we would be presenting the ordinance uh, as currently drafted to the planning commission and then it'll be presented to the city council at the May meeting for uh, implementation in June. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Point of clarification, are you recommending that we allow a accessory unit not have parking or is the recommendation that we make sure that they have enough space for parking? The state law prohibits a city from requiring parking right. for an accessory dwelling units. Okay. And so our code currently requires it. The code amendment would comply with state law to remove the parking requirement for accessory dwelling units. So that we can build a rental unit on a piece of property and we don't have to have parking for them. Is if it meets the qualifications of an accessory dwelling unit within our code, yes. Okay. Does that even say? <laughs> and our muni code can't supersede right. state law. Yeah. So yeah. I do think that there are going to be neighborhoods where that will turn into residential parking issues where, you know, you, you have a family where mom and dad both have a car, one or two teenagers have cars, 
the next door neighbor has an ADU with no parking, uh, so they're going to park on the street. I, it's going to be a mess. This will ultimately lead to um, a lot of challenges about who gets to use on street parking, but mm -hmm. it is what the state law has come through. And, and part of their argument, frankly, is low income people don't have cars. <laughs> I, I don't think that that is an accurate assumption. Mm -hmm. No, but, it's the other way um, around. <laughs> but the state does want to hear arguments about that, I guess, would be how I'd portray it. Well, if you're, in, uh, if you're in Portland when there's a bus rolling by every 15 minutes, I get it, uh, but when you're in Lebanon and smaller towns, it's it's a real development. It, it is. And believe me, people are going to take advantage of this as much as they can because, like Kamal said, it's a money maker, and developers are going to crank out two rents instead of one. Yeah. And so, yeah, exactly. I I can see where for you know mother-in-law suites, those type of units, and maybe she doesn't need a car. You know uh, the the parents don't need a car and that I can see where that is beneficial and we don't have to worry about the parking but otherwise I, I think it's going to be a mess yeah but it's a moot point for us yeah we don't get to control that eventually it's going to come down to how many family cars could be parked on the street we'll see that happen <laughs> do we need action tonight then we do no all right. Yeah. Thank you for that update. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number nine, request from Swift Summit 200-100 to waive or reduce fees for Cheetah Lake Park use on August 14th and 15th, uh, presented by me. So uh, I was approached by a gentleman named Trevor Spangle, uh, who puts on the Swift Summit 200-100. And for those of you who don't know, that's a it's a bike ride, bike race. They do a, a 200 mile and a 100 mile race. And um, I don't get me, don't quote me on the procedure, but they send them out on different days. They do these long rides. And then part of uh, the finish is they, they come into the finish line area, which used to be at Strawberry Plaza in conjunction with Conversion Brewing. And they would uh, have a celebration there, live music, the bikers would get their awards and all that stuff. Um, and it, it actually, started maybe three years ago four I four think. years ago yeah. and it's become a very successful uh race and um they have upwards of i, I wish i had trevor's uh email pulled up but he says right here they're estimating maybe 300 this year 300 participants yeah and so when we talk about tourism that's a great thing and, and those people come in and and they're here for a couple of days it's a two-day event so they're usually here the night before the day of day one and day two and a lot of them stay and and uh for day three to recover and yeah and they drink a lot of home. beer afterwards yeah anyway. i just i didn't define recover i just said recover <laughs> so uh so the with the uh covid restrictions though uh what what mr spangle just described to me was that they're unable to to have the event finish at strawberry plaza because they don't have enough space to accommodate the social distancing and so his request was, uh, did the city have any uh, areas such as Cheetah Lake Park, or he, he got also asked about River Park as a finish spot for them. And so um, they looked into that and that Cheetah Lake was available, River Park was not available. Um, but the, the, the request is to, to waive the fees for that. Um, I know we've done that in the past, but I also know that this year is a year like no other. And uh, I know we've had impact to our maintenance and our, our parks uh, budget because of a lot of COVID related things. So I wanted to kind of ask you, Nancy, if you can give me a rundown of what this would do, what impact this would have. I want to say the fee would be about $600. Per day, right? Uh, I believe so. Um, and and they, they do say they don't expect that to be a problem next year. Uh, but the, the year of lost leases last year means that they've kind of spent their capital on basic operating costs and they just don't have that up front. So um, I, I think we are, are willing to waive it. We've had staff pencil them into the park to make sure nobody else reserves it. Um, there, there will be other costs that they will bear in terms of placing porta potties and things like that. But uh, I think that's an understanding. And, and the same requirements apply, right? The park's gotta be left clean, the, all, all those things we're not waiving their responsibility. Yeah. We're just waiving the fee. Um, 
I would hate to see this event stall out again because I feel like it's a it's a growing event. It's it's actually really growing well, yeah. and uh, it's going to be I think a, a good thing for our community in the future. Um, and so, yeah, I understand the impact to staff, and I understand the impact to the to the to the budget. Um, but I think it's a it's a good move for us. And Trevor says in his letter that um, Brownsville is actually interested or open I don't to want to having lose it to the community either. And and I love Brownsville, but um, but he's pretty pat. He's from Lebanon. He's pretty passionate about keeping it in Lebanon and what the impact is for the city. So I would like to see us continue to support it. I worry that like we're in we're in low we're in high risk now. What's that? Seventy five people are allowed outside together. No, it's a it's a different it's a it's a per capita. Um, okay. It's an occupant load, basically, of the acreage. outside area. Okay, good. Yeah, good. So they they can accommodate that park can accommodate upwards of fifteen thousand people, believe it or not, safely. So okay. for the state good. requirements. What month do they have again? August fourteenth and fifteenth. Just a quick question. Yeah. Uh, looking at their website, they charge ninety five to two fifty. Do you know if they're present if they're offering a discount to the riders? I don't know. Yeah. I don't think they do because okay. because they will have other costs. They they provide yeah. aid stations. They'll have porta potties in the park. Um, I I'm relatively certain they have contracts with vendors to come in and sell food or a beer garden or something. I, I don't know everything that they do for that setup, but uh, and for all I know, they're going to have a band and and play music. So. It's a very well organized and very well run event. From what I, I went to the first one, and it was really a fun time actually to watch everybody come in and. But, but so. drive it. <laughs> no, Nancy, I can't drive a hundred miles in my car and not get sore. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna ride a bike a hundred miles. <laughs> if if we decide to do this, what I would like to ensure is this is basically a sponsorship, so that we get some marketing opportunities oh. out of it as well, and let those riders know that hey. Um, city of Lebanon is is wants you here, and we're investing in you coming back by great doing point. this sponsorship. It's a great right idea, now. yeah. It's a great point, and I'm sure they he would he'd be happy. They they'd be so happy to. Uh, and that Jason, I agree. And, and that Jason yeah. go out and make a presentation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another proclamation. Come come another good. problem. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think originally when I saw it, I like I like that idea a lot. I'm um, totally on board with that. Uh, originally when I saw this, I think I had the similar thought of when we had, were approached by Matt about Strawberry Plaza, which was, you know, I feel like it's important for folks to have skin in the game, so to speak, you know, when when instead of just giving the park away or, you know, even if it's for a weekend. But if we are able to get a sponsorship for maybe the cost of what it, I, and I know he sells these sponsorship spots because my employer has purchased them from him before. So um, I think with that idea, um, I'm, I'm on board with an in-kind donation. Yeah, with an in-kind donation great. for the park or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, I like it. I agree. That's great. Five, yeah. minute, five minutes for you to speak. Five? five yeah. Goodness. <laughs> you are new, aren't you? <laughs> so Nancy, can you reach out to, to Trevor and okay, great. Thank you. Do we have consensus? Yep. Okay. okay. And with that, we get to the city manager's report. Okay, so um, I got a couple of shout outs. One, I just want to name Rebecca Wurst and Susie Parker at the senior center who um, last week at least had already contacted more than 600 community members to help them get signed up for vaccines, uh, get them connected wow. to the connections to get them to the Lee County Fairgrounds. They have been making appointments at every pharmacy in town where they are giving the shots. And I think it's important to note that both Walmart and Safeway have called Kendra Oliver to thank her and her staff for the work they've been doing because helping people navigate these websites means they have not had pharmacists having to do that work and and having people confused as well so it's it's been truly beneficial to the community they are still offering that service if you are trying to get in for a vaccine it is in some cases a little spooky to make an appointment and and they will help they collect the emails and and you know the dates that you're scheduled to follow up everything else so i just i can't give them enough credit for what they're doing there we have had some of that at the chamber too. We've we've tried to help people when we can, but we have also sometimes it's beyond 
our expertise and we've sent people there too and they've been just great they are so patient so good um, and then I, um, uh, library has been back open more hours. They are busy. Um, and then the call out for Julie Tibbet. Um, she was cited by the state library journal and the Oregon young adult network for the pandemic stress relief program. She put together for teens who are really, um, kind of a special group here. And she's done a lot of things like create a Zen garden and, and some things like that to help teens deal with the stress and, and mental health issues. So I think that's good. Um, we are working with um, CPIP to look at turning over Peterson's Butte Tower to them. Um, we have radio equipment there. They have equipment there. There are some private industries that have equipment there. There is a goat track to get up to it. Um, we have no uh, expertise in this. So what we're trying to work on is a, is a trade. Um, they would take over operating Peterson's Butte um, and, and we would get some uh, connectivity and discounted prices on, on connecting up um, uh, some fiber optic lines. The first one we're trying to get run as quickly as possible actually would, would come into Wyrick Road. Um, and, and if we can get there uh, in time, I don't know if we, if we can, for example, for Strawberry Festival, it would be for Wi-Fi in Cedar Lake Park, which we think would be really beneficial. Hey, I know talking to Andy, IT is trying to work on how they can get some Wi-Fi devices that, uh, not for everybody to attend the Strawberry Festival, but at least for the organizers and the vendors who need access to credit cards to do those kinds of things. So work on that and hope to bring that agreement in the, in the next couple of months probably. It's been, something that's been worked off and on for about five or six years um, to make sure that that happens. And then the last thing I want to share with you is um, a group of us met with Strawberry Festival coordinators yesterday. It was a nice long meeting. Um, they have a 65, 70 page plan for how to hold Strawberry Festival in a safe way. They are consulting with um, the Oregon Health Authority, with OSHA, with the Department of Homeland Security on potential security issues. They are working carefully on um, having a tracking system to know how many people are in the park. The area will be fenced. There will be circles painted for physical distancing. I think it's important to know, and, and they have not yet hit their go, no go date. It's coming soon. And once they've hit that, if they decide to go forward, they're gonna make the announcement to the community. It's important to note as people ask you or talk about it, um, that, that basic COVID rules are going to apply. Masks must be worn the whole time unless you are eating or drinking actively. Um, sanitation facilities are gonna be there. Physical distancing will be there. They'll have circles painted for concerts for this, where your pod is and you stay in this circle. Um, and so they're, they're working really hard to get a strawberry festival put on this year so that Lebanon can celebrate hopefully coming out of pandemic. Um, I think we have some, we have some concern. This is a, a risk reward opportunity, which could be good or bad. Um, and, and so I think they're working very, very hard to mitigate the risk. We're going to try and make sure that the information that comes out in advance is, is very clear about what attendees are going to be required to do to maintain a safe festival. Their advertising is going to be really limited to Lebanon. They don't want a bunch of people coming in causing problems from elsewhere. Um, they are going to, I think, have a, have a, uh, a no, uh, tolerance policy. So if you're being a jerk, you're going to get kicked out. Um, that includes, I just, you can't make me wear a mask kind of stuff. You'll get kicked out and you won't, and, and, and the only way you'll get back in is to pay again to come back in. Um, so, so we are um, trying to support them in having this event for the community. I think we have some concern. Our caseload has been rising in Lynn County. The data from a week ago, we were up to 177 cases per 100,000. At 200 cases per 100,000, we would go back to extreme risk. And their attendance could be 50 people. So as much as we can do to bring case counts down, 
I think there's a real advantage to the community because if we could get back to moderate level, for example, they would not be stuck with a beer garden. They would be back to what they've done the last couple of years, which is you can buy your beer and go watch the kids on Ferris wheel. Um, so it, well. There's something kind of wrong it, with that. But. It, well, what it means is you're not chugging a beer. It's and and uh, having the impact of chugging a beer. So as you talk with community members about this, I just want to make sure that we're spreading the word and helping the Strawberry Festival get that word out in terms of what the rules are, uh, what's going to be required to make this a successful mm -hmm. event. We want it to be successful for the people who are chomping at the bit to get out, and we want it to be successful for people who really want to go, but they're a little iffy on being in a crowd. Um, we want everybody to feel welcome and, and come. So we're supporting that. We're going to help them um, to the degree we post their, their announcements and advertisements on our website, on our Facebook pages um, for, for everybody who's got one. So just so you know, that's, uh, that's what we're doing. Nancy, I assume this does not include a parade. Uh, it's going to include a reverse parade. So they will have the floats and you will drive through the parking lot the by, the, by the floats. Yeah. Um, they would, I think they would love to have the parade, but it's just not going to happen. They need the car. They're going to do fireworks only one night just um, over the lake, uh, but uh, it's going to be as, as good as I think they can get it. But Jason was there also representing the fire district, so I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, from a fire safety standpoint, the, they do the festival very well. And um, Cindy and her crew, uh, dating back to when Jamie did it, they, they really got behind public safety and the safety of the, of the patrons. And so they do that very well. Um, uh, my, my city council hat is a little uh, more concerned and I express that. And um, what, I, what I don't want is for, you know, word of this will spread. And one of the concerns is that this is the first event, you know, one of the first events is gonna be in Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's so early they really can't push the date back because they don't have the ability to get the park um, and, and the vendors and all those things and so um, my concern obviously was if we're bringing people in and we're cramming them you know relatively speaking you have to patrol all those people and make sure they're all social distancing and wearing their masks and uh, the potential for a super spreader event is real um, and our county numbers for vaccinations are fairly low i think there's a lot of doubt in our community about the the virus and about the vaccine and whether or not it's real or not real or effective or not effective and so we don't have strong vaccination rates right now and that's a that's a bad thing so um for events like this so that's that's my concern from the city standpoint. I what I don't want to do is, as I said in that meeting, I don't want to wear the badge of dishonor when, you know, by Fourth of July, uh, there's a there's a huge upswing and we're back to extreme. And if anything can point to the city of Lebanon or point to the Strawberry Festival, that would absolutely devastate me and I think devastate our community to a certain extent. So I'm I'm really I'm really up in the air on it. I'm not so sure. You have to lock down those businesses even tighter. Well, and the, it, we brought that up, you know, that the tourism is a good thing It would bring people out. And but at the same time, if we're in high or extreme, the ability for a business to accommodate that want that that uh, want for restaurant space or what have you is diminished. They can't let more people in. So they they may not even see more business because of that. So there was a lot of a lot of things talked about. It was a really good conversation. I, I think. The big thing for me from the city standpoint was that this zero tolerance policy of if you are in there with your mask down, um, when we talked about doing what the Jamboree does with a, with a wristband um, concept. And so basically security or whoever sees you, your mask is down, there's, there is zero tolerance. It is not put it up, please. It is, sorry, uh, you cut the band and you escort them out. And if they wanna pay to get back in, they do, but we need to take this really seriously as a community and make sure that people take it seriously because that's the only way it's gonna be successful. Yeah, I, I, I do encourage people to get back to the vaccinated if, if they're comfortable with doing that because it would help so many things if we could get back to moderate or low risk. Our restaurants could go back to 50% seating. You know, I, there's just benefit throughout the community if we can get our pace back down. I know there's some reluctance for vaccination, but 
I, I, in trying to help people get vaccinated, do we have vaccinations available that are not being taken advantage of? Because I, yes, yes, uh, yes, because yes. I've, I've had troubles getting people into it. Yes. Not that it's, it's not yeah. the availability. It's the. I would say any place that you can get it. So you can go to Bent County, to Reefer Stadium, <clears throat> to Corvallis Clinic last weekend had a drive-through. Marion County at the State Fairgrounds has a drive-through. You don't have to get the shot in the county that you live in. Right. Um, it, the, the preference is to, to get them, but we do have um, lots of appointments that are going unfilled. Lynn County right now is only 28% vaccinated. Um, and, and, and we've got to be able to get that rate up in order to stop the spread and, and be able to try and get back to normal. So when you say they're not being used, is that in, in Lebanon, in the area? Yeah, so, so um, County Health, yeah. It's, really it's really what you have appointments at Lynn County Health Department where you go to the fairgrounds to get the shots. I don't know what the usage is at the pharmacies in town. Well, that's I have, what I was saying. I've heard people are having trouble getting an appointment because they're full, but um, I have not personally seen that. Well, I didn't know. That's checked, what I have seen. I checked every pharmacy. pharmacy and everything. I mean, I guess I could travel, but I've been trying to get it and I can't find it anywhere. Right. And I've been Local. trying to get people in and I can't get them in. Is that a contradiction? I got mine at Bymart and, and they told me there they had more vaccines than they had applications for the day I went. But the governor just told us it's yeah, the CDC or the federal government's cutting Oregon back on the amount of vaccines. Yeah, because we do have a lot of um, areas in, in the state where you know, they have 800 vaccines and they get 150 people to sign up and half of them get to us to be covered. Um, and and that's, a, that's a real challenge in terms of trying to meet that public health need um, and, and slow the spread. And, and I, I, don't, I don't know why that happens. You know, why would people make an appointment and not show up? So uh, I do know that there is a push for more mobile, you know, we're going to take a van out to some place and give shots here. Um, I, I don't know how successful those are. So now we've had the blood clot thing pop up. We have. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are we asking the festival board to recommend vaccines to be to come in? We're asking them to encourage uh, people to vaccinate as a way to help Lebanon put on a successful festival. Uh, I think we have. You know, you got to be careful with what you require of someone right. with their body, but you're asking for that in the marketing campaign. I believe they were going to, if I understood that right, they were going to encourage people to, you know, if you haven't, you know, the more vaccinated we are, the more successful this event would be, kind of a thing. Sounds a bit political, doesn't it? It is, it is. But I, I think we were also talking to them about the kind of carrot approach of if we could get case counts back to the moderate level, there would be benefits to attendees and some flexibility that won't be there um, if, if we're at high. And of course, if we go to extremes, all bets are off. You, you can't put on a festival with 50 people. And, and the state requirements are any outdoor event, regardless of the space, is going to be limited to 50 people in the extreme risk category. Um, now, we do have some time. It's not until the first weekend in June, so we have some time to get those case counts down, and there's kind of a hope that as we come off of the Easter spring break surge, that we will start seeing cases going back down. The numbers today were not good. Uh, not good at all. Jason, also, what happens when the word will get out that there's going to be a subway festival? Right. You know, Eugene, Portland. Yeah. People are going sure. to Salem, there. yeah. That, that was discussed, you know, and they, they talked about, and I think rightfully so, they want to focus it on Lebanon, but the reality is with social media and even conventional media, you, you, can't, you can't hide it, right? Uh, as soon as someone hears that, you know, the, the festival's a go, uh, that's what I told Cindy, I said, you're going to have KEZI and KMTR, they're going to be up here, you know, hey, tell us about your festival, and then it, everyone's There's gonna somebody know. on the buzz asking every day, if not 10 times a day, are we having a strawberry festival? And we're getting a ton of phone calls from all over the place asking. 
Well, they so. can say that they are very close to having to call a go, no go, go because they have to find contract with right. vendors to assure that they will have the carnival ride. Yeah. And food Entertainment and was the big, big oh, dollar yeah. one for them. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I, I kind of felt yesterday like we were kind of the last meeting to see if we were supported um, uh, before they they sat down to make their final decision. But I did, they didn't give us a date. You know, like we have to decide by April twenty first or something like. They that. They have worked so hard. They have so worked hard. So hard. Unbelievable hours and documentation yes. for how they're going to operate. Yeah, um, they're working really hard to make this space and to make it fun for the people from Lebanon to be able to get out of their houses and enjoy a long-standing tradition. Yep. The real challenge. Yep. So that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, any items from council? I had one quick question. Um, when I brought up um, Strawberry Plaza, I just wanted to know, um, I know after our discussion, we uh, left it to staff to kind of work with a conversion brewing and to figure out the solution moving forward. So is there an ETA on, now that it's warming up on removing the tent and regaining um, access to Strawberry Plaza or? Great okay. question. So, so we have notified Matt Cowart that um, uh, his his current agreement lasts through tomorrow, April 15th, and that he needs to take the big tent down. We have suggested that he could put his smaller awning over his original seating area that would stick out a little bit in the Strawberry Plaza and potentially add another up against the wall of the restaurant a little bit farther back. But we're at the point where we need to get in and do maintenance. It's time to turn on the tap. And we can't really do that with a big tent, but the communication that has come through tonight during this meeting is he's getting a lot of people saying, no, no, he, he needs to, he needs to appeal that, keep the big tent. Um, and we, we kind of are reminding him it was supposed to be until the weather is warmer. Um, because now we are starting to see more people wanting to be able to stroll in or sit in that plaza and then, you know, eat lunch or play with kids or whatever. So we will have more discussion with him tomorrow. Okay, thank that you. The agreement. That was the agreement. And I, and I well, I realize it's it's April and we will still have rainy days between now and the end of the fiscal the year. The year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, until well, no, July seventh or eighth until October is usually <laughs> relatively dry. But um, and, and I understand because we are. Uh, at high risk, he lost indoor seating again. Right. But um, but it is a public park, and uh, it needs to be returned back to the public <clears throat> for their use. Can I get what uh, the the offset or the other side of that coin, as we talked about before, is um, it it does provide a place to go out to eat when they when we're at a are they twenty five percent capacity and um so so there is a public benefit to it being there but there's also a public benefit to it being gone so and yeah, this was enacted though we were in extreme that's that's why this was enacted, yeah because there was no indoor seating and so then we went to high right. that allowed yeah. for 25 percent. so there is an indoor option um and now that there's a you know potential go back again to to medium the 50 percent or you know you have the drier days to eat outside yeah. and not be rained on and stormed on so yeah I, I i'm glad i'm glad to hear you're already like thinking about that i did I since we're on the topic while we we're talking about this i got a text from scott bressler um in the sisters rodeo which was scheduled for the 9th and 13th they have canceled that um event they were planning on doing it but it's now been scratched 9th and 13th of which of june so that would be the weekend after Sorry, festival. yeah hmm. so Stay tuned, I guess. Anything else from council? I have one more. I'm yep. sorry. No, go for it. <laughs> um, so with the COVID funding from the Fed, the federal government that's coming down, do we have an idea of how much the city of Lebanon is <clears throat> going to receive? Three and a half million dollars. Okay, great. What we don't, what <laughs> that's we a lot don't of money. have right now is the guidance from Treasury on kind of exactly what we can use it for. Mm -hmm. So our plan at this point is to include it in a lump sum in the general fund budget with an expectation that there will be 
sometime in the fiscal year, there will be council discussion about um, options for using that money and a decision on what to prioritize. And then uh, we would move that money around. Um, one of the highest items on our list right now would be to use that money for West Side Interceptor that um, might let us decrease the borrowing and decrease the debt load on the wastewater fund, mm. which would mean we would not have to come in with higher rate increases in the next couple of years. Um, we're trying to be really sensitive to that, but that project needs to needs to complete. Um, uh, if not that, we'd be looking at other infrastructure, water line replacements, sewer line, lateral. Um, we, it, um, we could use it for broadband. And we have a couple of small projects we would look at for um, the city's fiber. Um, uh, but, but it's not clear, for example, if the money could be used for streets, right? So if, if you ended up having a million dollars, could you do some uh, neighborhood street work? That we're waiting for guidance from Treasury, and there is no estimate right now on when that guidance will come to the report. So we're in a wait and see period here, and okay. expect at some point to, to get clearer and then be able to come to council and say, here is the brilliant ideas that we have for how to spend this three and a half million dollars to clear seven times over. Um, what, what, what do you want to prioritize? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Now, I will tell you, we have submitted a notice to the state of a desire for a state grant of their ARC money. Uh, I saw the request today and said we'd take $6 million for the West Side Interceptor. Again, the ability to reduce the borrowing would be truly beneficial. And as grant, we wouldn't have to pay back. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is shovel ready. We could, we could get that investment in infrastructure immediately. Um, it is, uh, it would be helpful in terms of being a, a lower income community with a high rent burden to be in a place where um, we were not going to have to do significant rate increases. I have no idea if the state will entertain six million or come back and say, well, here's 10 bucks, leave me alone. Mm -hmm. but, but, <laughs> but we submitted our notice of intent and, and the request for one time at this point, it's like, well, Ask, maybe they'll give it to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not right. asking is a for sure zero. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's not like we don't have a lot of infrastructure that we could spend that money on. So that's probably going to be a primary recommendation coming from us. Okay. Well, thank you. I just wanted I wanted to know how much it was and what the what when we were going to I guess discuss that, but that's a later date. So thank you. That's a really good question. Any other questions from council? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. Lots of questions. Uh, do we, yes, sir. Re really quick. Back to the tent situation. Um, when is that date for the for it to be removed? Tomorrow. 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 And when is the date for the next uh, recommendation of whether we're going up or down on the that scale? That should come out next, next Friday. Monday or Tuesday, based on number data sheet this Friday. Next Monday or Tuesday. So if we went back to higher risk, unfortunately then that tent will be needed, you think? So so we're at high now. If no, we go no. back to extreme, extreme is what I meant. we couldn't have any indoor seating infrastructure. So my under I thought we did away with the extreme category unless the hospital systems were overwhelmed. I thought that was a state thing I, that came out. Um, you know, they they keep kind of changing that. And, and they do have some counties that are in the extreme risk category right now, including some that moved up into the extreme risk category. Yeah. So I Lincoln. don't know if that guidance changed where that was there, last or, week, or, right? Yeah. Or those counties where the hospital is okay. overwhelmed. I I don't realistically I don't really track what happens in other communities. <laughs> I don't care what they're calling about. And my apologies for interrupting. Huh? My apologies for interrupting. No, not at all. I was just thinking, um, since it is tomorrow, are we asking him to, to remove it quickly? I asked him to remove it. And and I was just thinking that, but can we wait a week? Basically, trying to reduce his profile. Right, right now, right. he's taking about half of the park space. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's it not does, the most beautiful It does, thing. as you walk by, it does kind of look like, I'm only going to come in here if I'm going in a tent to eat. Right. Um, and, and so trying to push him back a little bit more towards the wall. But again, you said, you know, put your put your awnings over it, but not the full. Yeah, tent. he still would have coverage, uh, you know, the ability to cover tables. And then that with the, the initial intent was that 
the combination of the good weather yeah. uh, with a lower risk level right. so even made it if, the time. So even if we go to back to extreme, he'd still be able to, people would still be able to use it with, with some cover. We just right. not, just not that specific tent, tent in that right. specific location. Yeah. At 30 degrees and, you know, That's trying to keep everybody warm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's only six to one right now. Still short to weather. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, our next scheduled council meeting is May 5th at noon. That's the electronic uh, budget meeting. And we'll also have the 6th and 7th earmarked if possible, but I'm confident we'll get through that on May 5th. And uh, then again, May 12th for the regular session at 6 p.m. here at the travel station. And as long as things stay the way they are, we'll do a similar um, similar meeting. So uh, will, the, will we be here for the electronic session or is it a full electronic session for everyone? Do you know? For the budget committee, yes, it would be a full electronic session for everyone. Council included. It's too many people. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we can't we can't fit everybody in here, and it seems odd to have the citizen members dialed in by the Zoom. Hundred percent. Yep. Uh, and so it will be a full. Okay. Yeah. With that, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.